Amen. Jesus, we just want to come before you with humility today and just say thank you for the cross. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for everything that you've done for us, for the sacrifice that you became for us, Lord, that you took our sin, that we're all here because you've adopted us into your family. And Lord, we're just so grateful. And we're happy to be here, God. We're happy to be in your loving presence. And we pray that you would awaken us today, Lord. Open our hearts, soften our hearts. Let us be changed internally by your, your sweet spirit, Lord. We love you and we invite your holy presence into this room with us as it already is. We love you so much, God. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody said, amen. 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 Thank you to the two strapping young men that took up this table for me. They did it while your eyes were closed, so you didn't get to see who it was. So they still get their reward in heaven. Amen? Amen. Well, I, I shaved my head yesterday, so I'm fresh, shiny, and anointed, and uh, ready to rock and roll. And uh, I just wanted to, s- to start by saying um, that the Lord changed my message quite a bit since Tuesday. And I sent this graphic in. It doesn't really make any sense. So I'm going to make a short statement in the beginning that ties this message into my new message. Uh, so you guys, you know, just don't even pay attention, okay? You ready? You guys just tune this part out, but I have to say it, Okay. Uh, so, so many times, I'm going to tie it in, it's going to make sense. So many times when we get, uh, we kind of get stuck in life looking at the past or we, you know, we get surrounded with worry and anxiety about our future, but oftentimes we just don't know what to do right now. You ever been there? Just, we're stuck in the now. We're, we're just right now. We, we, we can't control anything that happened, and yet we worry so much about what happened. And we can't control the future, and yet we worry so much about the future, and yet what we can control, we often don't control and, and it makes us stuck. And, and so I wanted to answer the question, what do we do in the meantime? Okay, that's my whole connection, okay? Everybody clap. Very nice, okay, good. That was my old message, now for my new message. No, I'm just kidding. What do we do in the meantime? I wanna to attempt to answer that question this morning. What does God want us to do while we're waiting? What does he want us to do right now? We don't know what to do. What's our default? What is the thing that we go back to day in, day out, morning, afternoon, night, no matter what's going on, mountaintop, valley, in rich, uh, when we're rich, when we're poor, when we're in the middle somewhere, whatever it is, in, in any season of our life, what does God really want from us at the core? And I believe that God wants intimacy from us. It's interesting that the two most important commandments that Jesus said when he was asked is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You would think it'd be like, do not murder, right? Like, do not murder, do not commit adultery. Those are the top two. No, that's what we would say. But Jesus has, uh, has a difference in priority in his moral, uh, in his moral compass. And his, the height of morality is actually our love. And so if we'll love God, all the other things will follow. So he, he actually commands us. The most important thing he tells us to do is love the Lord our God with all our heart and all our soul, our mind, and our strength. And that's a, that's a big ask. In fact, it's something that we can't actually do by ourselves. We need the Holy Spirit to help us surrender, to help us to live in obedience to God and to obedience to his word and to obedience to the things that he's called us to do. But these are the two most important commandments. And I, I, I've heard it compared uh, like we're a car and we can't run without oil. And God is the oil and our relationship with God is the oil and we can't run without him. And I, I think that's a good illustration, but it's really shallow. And I think Jesus makes a better comparison. You see, a car needs oil, but it doesn't love oil, right? I mean, a car is an inanimate object. It's, it's just stale. There's nothing there. It doesn't love oil. It doesn't want oil. It just needs oil to run. And I think oftentimes we treat our relationship with God like a car needs oil. Like, God, I don't really want you. I don't really love you, but I need you, so here I am. And we, we all get there at different times in our life to different degrees. But my goal this morning is to bring us from that into a much deeper, more life-giving love relationship with Jesus this morning. Amen? I want to call us back to intimacy today. I want to reel us in because the world is reeling for your attention. The politics are reeling for your attention. Everything around us is pulling and dragging us away from intimacy with God, but God wants to, this morning, quiet your heart, call you back to the table with him, back to intimacy, back to fellowship, every day and he wants to transform you by doing that and I'm going to explain this morning how I believe he wants to do that and so a better illustration of what God compares himself to Jesus says I am true food it's better than oil in a car because we do need food and we do need God but we also want food does anybody want food some of you want food right now I can tell on your face 
We don't just need food, but we actually want food. And we love food. Some of us love it a little too much. I am in that camp sometimes. I'm actually on a slim streak, so I'm doing pretty good. Okay, but we'll see what happens in a couple months. <laughs> the holidays are coming. All right. But you see, we need food to survive, just like a car needs oil. But deeper than that, we, we want food and we love food. And so Christ has compared himself to food, I believe, for that reason. Because it's a better comparison as to our need and our desire and our relationship with God than a car just simply needing oil, than our salvation just simply needing the cross, needing the blood, needing the resurrection to go to heaven. Yes, we need him, but that's the base level. The base level is our need. What we need to progress from is transforming, and the Holy Spirit will do it, transforming our heart and our desires and our intimacy and our love, the things we love and we crave. Amen? And so when I was a kid, there was one place that was constantly a place of stubbornness for me, and it was the table. I'm going to say the table. The place called the table. And, and when I was a kid, I would give my parents such a hard time at the table. I'm going to say the table. There was one night in particular, my, my dad's laughing because he already knows because it's so ridiculous. There was one night in particular, my dad and my mom, they're great cooks. So it's not like we had mediocre food growing up. We, they were great, okay? If anybody's ever had his barbecue, you know, we're not, you know, we're blessed, all right? They made bratwurst for dinner one night. And now I'd be like, heck yeah, I'll take bratwurst for dinner like five, four out of six, you know, four out of seven nights a week. I don't even care. So they made bratwurst for dinner one night and I just decided I didn't like it that night. Does anybody have kids that's ever done that? They just had it yesterday and they were drooling over it, but today they don't like it. They don't want it. Okay, all right, whatever. I don't believe you. But I was sitting there at the table and my parents made this comment that, I, that I'm sure that some of you guys have said to your kids before. I haven't tried it yet. I'm going to try it eventually. Uh, you're not getting up from the table until you finish X, Y, or Z. And so I, I was told by my dad, you're not getting up from the table until you finish your bratwurst. I know you like it. We had it last week and you're going to eat it. And if you don't eat it, you're going to sit at the table until you do eat it. I don't care if it's cold. I don't care if it gets moldy. I don't care if there's mac. No, he didn't say that. He didn't say that. He'd probably just make me a new one. But I, I was stubborn. I mean, I was, I was really trying to match his stubbornness and match my parents in that way. And so I sat at the table for hours. I sat at that table for hours. Everybody was long gone. I'm the only one in the kitchen. Everybody's out in the, you know, in the living room watching TV, playing games, having fun, doing whatever. I am sitting at the table. I sat there so long, I laid my head down and fell asleep on the kitchen table with the bratwurst next to my head. And... That was just, it's just a ridiculous example of some things that we often do. I believe that the table of God represents our intimacy with him. And I believe that some of us are sleeping at the table. That Christ has prepared this meal before us. That Christ is, the Bible says, the meal before us. He's this person that is so beautiful and so wonderful. And he's perfect and he's amazing. And he wants to nourish us and bring us life. And yet we're sleeping at the table, sleeping on the things that God has called for us to consume that will actually radically transform us from the inside out, like Pastor Jordan said earlier, from the heart. But we're sleeping at the table, refusing to eat the things that God has for us. And so I want to wake us up today. I want to wake us up so we can finish the bratwurst, okay? Turn to the person next to you to say, finish the brat. You need to finish the brat. And so... I want to wake us up. I want us to be able to be aware of the beautiful, bountiful meal that Christ has for us and that Christ is for us so that we can actually partake in the life of God. It says this in Revelation 3.20. It says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. This is Christ talking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and what with him? Eat. What? What did you say? Sup. Does it say sup on the screen? Oh, it's just a key, it's a KJV, isn't it? Okay. You threw me off. I thought I had the wrong verse. All right. I'm going to read it again because you threw me off. All right, Dr. Paul. If anyone hears my voice no, and opens the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and eat with him, right? So this eating we see in the New Testament, Jesus did that a lot with his disciples, a lot with even sinners and tax collectors. It's a place of intimacy. It represents our intimacy with God, our prayer life, our communication with God, our worship, our loving exchanges with Jesus. That's what the table is here to represent. In John 6, 54 through 57, it says this, Jesus is saying to the disciples a very offensive phrase, that caused many to leave him. He said, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life 
and I will raise him up on the last day for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him as the living father sent me and I live because of the father. This is the phrase I want you to get. So whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. And so just like food brings life and sustenance, if you're eating real food, brings life and sustenance to our physical bodies, Christ is our spiritual food that we're called to consume in the process of intimate times with him that brings life to our spirit man. And if we're not consuming Christ, if we're not spending time in prayer, spending time in his word, spending time in fellowship with him face to face, because Jesus, I just called him Jesus, Pastor Jesus, no. Pastor Jordan said in his transition so beautifully, he's like, we don't have to ask the presence of God to come in the room. He's with us all the time. He said, I will never leave you as orphans. He says, I'm sending another. It's kind of the Holy Spirit. And he said, I'm sending another like you. And in other places, he says, I and the Father will make our home with him. That means he'll dwell with us. And that means that there's never a time that you don't have access to the presence of God. There's never a time in your life that you can't just close your eyes. All it takes, like he said, so beautifully, it tied in so well to my message. I should have just let him keep going. All you have to do is just close your eyes and get your attention on the right thing. Turn your heart towards him. And all of a sudden, you could be sitting at this beautiful table with this meal in front of you, consuming and getting life from him. And so this is the place we need to be. And before I get too excited and and make my intro too long, sorry, my voice is going... Before I make my intro too long, I'm gonna calm down and talk like this. Now, I've got three points for us. And for those of you who know me, uh, anybody with ADHD uh, that gives you a sermon that makes sense, it's coherent, it flows well together, it has three points, it's a miracle from the Lord. Uh, and so you need to thank God right now. So just give him a hand clap of praise that you get a three point sermon from a, from a, from a guy who can't connect two dots, amen? <laughs> And so I want to talk about what is accomplished at the table. What happens to us internally when we come to the table, when we have our intimate times with the Lord? Number one is he nourishes you. Say nourishes. He nourishes you. He nourishes you. And so that's what any good food will do. We have a lot of fake food. We have snacks. We have ultra processed food that does not nourish you. We have obese, malnourished people in America. That's crazy. And because not all food, only real food will nourish your body, will give you the nutrients that you need for your body to to operate at an optimal point. Christ is true food. Christ is real food. And the only way for you to operate optimally in your spirit, man, in your your physical body, your soul, and your spirit, and your mind is to consume real food, Christ. And so uh, any of us who have kids will understand this point really, really well because kids sometimes do this thing where they'll sit down at the table and they'll push their food around with their fork for 30 minutes telling you that they're not hungry. And then they'll get up from the table and what do they want? Snacks. Everybody say snacks. You've got this dinner in front of you that I know you like. Okay, don't try to fool me. I'm smarter than you. Okay, you're three. All right? I'm way smarter than you. Not like a ton smarter, but like a lot smarter. And so the kids will just push their their food around with their fork and they'll mess around with it and they'll try to convince you that they're not hungry. And the minute they get up from the table, they want the junk. Because their bodies, you know, we give it to them so often, their bodies crave it. They love this this intense sugar high. They love the candy and they love the snacks and the bars and the the fruity stuff and the, and the, the sugary stuff. They love that stuff. It's like crack to kids. And so it, but they love it so much that we give it to them and it's, and it's fine, you know, in moderation. But I want to illustrate that what happens when we get up from the table hungry is we crave the wrong things. And what will happen if you go into the world hungry is you'll begin to crave the world. The world is not true food. The world will not nourish your soul. The things of this culture will not nourish your spirit man and push you towards intimacy with Jesus. If you don't go to the table for breakfast in the morning with Jesus, to consume Jesus, to consume the things that he's called for us to consume, to have intimacy with Jesus, and we go into the world hungry, you're going to notice every fast food line driving down the road. Am I right? If you don't get filled up in the morning when you go, when you go out into the world without being satisfied and nourished in your soul, you might be able to go a couple days But eventually your old cravings are going to kick back in. Why? Because you're not being nourished. 
You don't have the nourishment that you need. Christ is not filling your stomach, so your stomach is yearning for other things. The world starts to look edible again when God says the world's not really edible for you. The way it's, it's all poison. See, the end of sin and the wages of sin is death. That's what happens when we eat this junk from the world. And so Christ has said, I am true food, eat from me. And the, the real way to, to avoid sin and to fight and beat temptation is not fighting it with your willpower. It's not to go out into the world hungry and just say, no, I'm not gonna eat that. No, I'm not gonna eat that. No, I'm not gonna eat because you're not having any life there. What you need to do is you need to get filled up with the right stuff and your palate begins to change. Anybody who's eaten healthy long enough knows that that junk actually doesn't even taste good after you've had carrots for 30 days, right? Like carrots start to taste sweet. Am I right? I've heard from people that, I've, I've never done it, okay? I'm, I'm just gonna be honest. I tried carnivore for a month and, and I didn't make it a month. I made it seven days and I was just, I needed, I needed carbs. But you know, it, it just, when we don't fill ourselves up with nourishing food, with true food, with Christ, we begin to crave the things of the world again. And so I, I don't want you to fight your temptations with your willpower, with your strength. I don't want you to fight your hunger pains. Just get rid of the hunger pains with real food. That's the ultimate way to fight temptation. Because I know when I leave the house and I don't eat breakfast, I'm looking at the McDonald's drive through and it is calling my name. I mean, those golden arches might as well be, you know, golden streets to the kingdom of heaven. They are just beautiful. And I'm like, oh, I need a little bit of that because I didn't eat anything real for breakfast. And so get filled up. Tell the person next to you, get filled up at the table of God, at the table of God. And so we can't get up from the table while we're still hungry. You need to stay at the table until you're full, really. And so 1 Kings 19, we see this story of a man named Elijah in the Old Testament. And Elijah, this is a really, really good example of what Christ will do for your soul when you eat him, when you take him in, when you have fellowship with him. It says this, so Jezebel sent this message to Elijah, may the God strike me and even kill me by this time if tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. Talking about the prophets of Baal and Asherah that he called down fire and then killed all the false prophets on the mount called Carmel. And so she's after him, she's sending threats to him. And it says, Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba in the town of Judah, uh, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. That's pretty dark. That's a dark place. He's ready to end it. He's ready to be over. He's not interested in continuing. And so it says, then he laid down and he slept under the broom tree, probably just waiting for God to kill him eventually. But as he was sleeping, the angel of the Lord touched him and told him, get up and eat. Turn to the person next to you and say, get up and eat. Get up and eat. The angel touched him and said, get up and eat. And Elijah looked around and there was beside his head some baked bread on hot stones in a jar of water in the middle of the wilderness. So he ate and he drank and he laid down again. And the angel was like, come on, get some seconds. I got extra here for you. And the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, get up and eat some more. That is a word from the Lord right there for Thanksgiving. Amen. Get up and eat some more. Or the journey ahead, this is the caveat that he said, eat some more or what? What will happen if you're not full, if you're not satisfied with this bread and this water that I've had to offer you? Or the journey ahead will be too much for you. In other words, you're not gonna make it. And so he got up and he ate and he drank and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. One meal, one meal of this bread from heaven, one sip of this jar of living water, and he had enough strength to make it 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness with no other food and no other drink to make it to the mountain of God. Christ is the living bread. Christ is the hot bread baked by your head. And if you're laying under a broom tree this morning and you find yourself looking like Elijah and you find yourself in a place where you're running and you're fearful and you're anxious and you've got temptation that you can't seem to shake and you've got chains and you've got bondage and you've got burdens on your shoulder that you can't carry, Christ is the bread by your head under the broom tree. And he's saying, wake up this morning and eat some of me. And you know what's gonna happen? Even though the devil will try to tell you it's not gonna work, you're gonna need a little bit more time. You can't just read a couple of scriptures and expect it to do anything. You can't just spend one day in his presence and he's gonna take you right back. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Christ has never sent away somebody who's come to him with humility, ever. 
He is waiting at the table with you right now saying, if you're weary, if you're laying down, if you're in solitary, if you're just enduring this terrible stress and and terror and, and horror and trials in your life, I am the bread that will strengthen you to make it through this journey. Until what? Until you make it to the mountain of God. What is that? It's the throne of grace, baby. Jesus takes us right to the throne of grace where the Bible says we could come boldly right to the throne of grace where we can get help in our time of need. Christ is the bread that strengthens us for the journey of life, which is really, really hard. Some of you know that better than others, that life can be really, really hard, that this journey is hard, that this path that we're walking on is not a yellow brick road to to the Wizard of Oz. It's like this is hell's highway sometimes. And he didn't promise you that you would have a life without consequences, a life without issues, a life without drama, a life without relationship strife, a life without pain, a life without sickness, a life without these things. He never promised those things. What he promised, he said, I will be there for you and I will be the food that will strengthen you in the middle of it. And that's why the book of Revelation is filled with, to the one who endures. To the one who endures, I will, I will, I will, I will. I will give him the crown of life. I will give him to eat from the jars of the manna in heaven. I will give him this and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on it. And to the one who endures, to the one who endures, that's what he's calling us to this morning. And the food that builds endurance in your spirit, man, is Christ. And it's fellowship with Jesus. And if you find yourself like Elijah right now, you need to do what the angel told Elijah to do. You need to get up and eat. And what happens sometimes when we don't eat enough We lose our appetite for the right things. And so we just think because we don't want it that God doesn't really want us just to try. I just want to tell you just from experience that there are times in your life where you're not going to want to read the Bible. You're tired, you're stressed, you're anxious. You think that there's some other productive things that you could be doing. But I promise you, if you will just force feed yourself for a little bit, your appetite's going to come back. And you're going to recognize the truth that that Christ is the living bread, that the word of God nourishes your soul. And you're going to find yourself in that place when you're finally full of the right thing and you're finally nourished and you know what it feels like to be healthy internally, you're going to find that you never want that junk anymore. You're not going to want the junk food anymore. You're not going to want the stuff the world wants to cram down your throat that the devil wants to tempt you with. We need to get nourished this morning. Say nourished. Nourished. He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn from me for I'm gentle and I'm lowly in heart and you'll find rest for your souls, right? This is this idea, come to the table, come to me. Take my yoke upon you, my burden is easy and my yoke is light. How beautiful is that? How beautiful is that? He says, I wanna take your burdens, but you gotta come to the table. You gotta come to the table to get nourished. So the first point is he nourishes our soul. The second point is he refocuses us. He refocuses us. You know, we just finished, uh, my daughter just played her first season of three-year-old soccer, which is as chaotic as you can possibly imagine. Um, she just finished her, her three-year-old soccer league. We had our last game on Saturday, and I got to be the head coach, which was just an absolute blast most of the time. And we, we had a lot of fun, and she did really good. She was participating, and there were some kids that are better than others, but, you know, it was really good, and we had a good time, and she learned how to play, and it was just a great time. But one of my only jobs, I, I was sitting there beforehand. I was, like, dreaming about all these drills I'm going to teach these three-year-olds. And I'm thinking, oh, these three-year-olds, they're going to be the best three-year-old team in our league. Oh, we're going to go to the finals. We're gonna, they're going to be like, this team is so good. They're gonna, we're going to put them against the five-year-olds. This is, what is this coach doing? some kind of magic formula he's got that he just, these little FIFA players over here. And it's like, I was sitting here dreaming and fantasizing, just thinking, oh, this team's gonna be so good. I'm gonna make them so good. I'm gonna do these drills and we're gonna do our practice. And, and I don't, I know they're all expecting them to, to stink really bad, but I'm gonna make them so good. And I realized that my only job as the head coach of a three-year-old soccer team is to refocus. My literal only job. Look over there. The goal is that way. Go that way. Hey, where's the ball? Hey, 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 over there. Where's the ball? Hey, hey, Levi, hey, hey, Caleb, hey, 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 Amelia, hey, over there, look, 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 the goal's over there, turn around, turn around, where's the ball, look at the ball, right there, right there, I'm not kidding, it's that bad, (laughs) times four on the field at all times, one soccer game, there was a hot air balloon that flew over the field, (laughs) that is a task, God gives his toughest battles to his, his, you know, It's a hot air balloon. I'm not kidding. It's been worse timing. Every kid on the field, both teams, 
look, look at this. Uh, oh my. I'm like, yes, I see the hot air balloon. Let's bring it down to earth, okay? Your goal's there. Look, everybody's distracted. Now's your chance. Sneak in there. <coughs> oh, I think God knows what it's like to be a three year old soccer coach with his kids who just don't know how to keep their focus on the right things who just can't keep their minds on the things above. They're stuck on the things below. They're stuck in the clouds. They're stuck on the hot air balloons. They're stuck over here. They're stuck over there. And God's just saying, hey, 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 look at me, look at me, look at me. That's what he's saying. And his job is so difficult. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Are you laughing or are you crying? A little bit of both. <laughs> I was like, I didn't think that was one of my, my powerful points. I have, I have a point in here that I think you're going to cry, but that's not right now. <laughs> but the Lord is like, he's just got, he put his spirit within us to refocus us constantly. How many know it's so easy to get distracted? It's so easy to, to forget the goal. We're on the field and all of a sudden we're running with the ball. We're doing so good, so good, so good. And then all of a sudden, whoop, it just takes a second. And then, oh, there it is. There's the butterfly. There's the hot air balloon. There's this, there's that. Oh, my shoe's untied. Oh, my, my shin guards are hurting me. Okay, just stop. And you know, the, the Lord has called us to the table to refocus us. One of the best things you can do when you recognize that you're distracted is to just sit down. Turn your phone off, right? There's a rule that we had growing up, no phones at the dinner table. Christ has the same rule, okay? I just want to update you with the rules of heaven, okay? No phone at the dinner table, okay? When you come to me, don't bring your phone unless you're using it for a Bible. But even then, like, just get a paper Bible. It's way better, you know? Like, come to the table, put your phone away, get the distractions out of here, wake up at a time where nobody else is awake, stay up till a time where everybody else is asleep, where things are quiet, find those little moments throughout the day. I remember I delivered for Amazon, and there would be times where I would just remember that I could commune with God at any time I want, and I'd put my van in park, and I'd just set an alarm for five minutes, and I'd sit there, because I knew my bosses weren't going to care, because I did my job well. And I sat there, and I closed my eyes, and I just thought about him, and I just felt his presence, and I was like, okay, just had a little, I just went to the table. It's not difficult to come to the table. He follows us wherever we go. He's with us wherever we go. It's an easy thing, actually, to come to the table. He's made it very easy, so easy that he says that you have to become like a child, actually, to come to the table of God, to come to the kingdom of God. And so he refocuses us at our table, at the table with the intimate times of the Lord. He refocuses our heart's attention. In Song of Solomon 4, 9, he says this, he says, you have captured my heart, my treasure, my bride. You hold it hostage with one glance of your eyes, with a single jewel of your necklace. You see, the way to get undistracted, the way to refocus your heart is looking at the most beautiful person in the universe. Jesus is literally pure beauty. And the only reason we don't see it sometimes is because we're busy looking at other things. But Christ is so beautiful. And Christ, you know, on the road to Emmaus, when he's talking to the disciples and they didn't recognize him, and they're walking on the road and Jesus had somehow hidden himself, disguised himself, maybe put on a fake mustache or something. I think he might do something like that. He's funny. Yeah. I don't know what he did. But he did something and they didn't recognize him. It's probably spiritual. Because <clears throat> at the table he didn't rip off a fake mustache. He's like, ah, here I am. No, it wasn't him. But he was on the road to Emmaus and these two disciples, they didn't recognize him. And they're walking on the road and they're talking to Jesus about what happened to Jesus. And Jesus is like, don't you understand that these things had to happen? I had to suffer and, you know, this person had to suffer and die in order for the Israel to be saved and this thing to, to move forward. And so they come and they beg him to stay. Their hearts were burning, the Bible says, as they talked with this man who they didn't recognize. And they come into the house and they sit down at the table. And the moment they sat down at the table, what did Jesus do? They sit down at the table. He breaks the bread. And the moment he breaks the bread, they recognized him and he disappeared. It's like, what the heck, Jesus? I just recognize you. Come back. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why he disappeared, but I do know that it was at the table that he broke the bread. And it's at the table when he breaks the bread that your eyes will be open to see the truth about God, the beauty of Jesus. It's not until you sit down at the table and wait for Jesus to just go like this, uh, break the bread. And he's going to spiritually open your eyes by the power of the Holy Spirit to see the beauty of his face. And when you see his beauty and when you see how good he is and when you know how faithful he's been and when you know how kind he is and you know that his discipline is for your good even though it stinks right now and you know that he's a father that cares for you that wants to give good gifts to your children and you know that he's invested so much in you that he's not going to abandon you now because he who freely gave his son how will he not also freely give us all things? When you know those things about Jesus, the things of the world, about, you know, that old song says grow strangely dim. They grow strangely dim. 
And so he calls us to the table, sits across from us at the table to refocus us, to capture us with his beauty. Hebrews 12, uh, one through two says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, this is directly after Hebrews 11, talking about all those old saints that, that accomplished things. And the, the Bible says they didn't even all of them accomplish and, and achieve the promises that God had said for them. But what did they do? They persevered with faith. And so this is directly after he says, you're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so tightly and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus. I never recognized this before, but I used to think that the race that was set before us was my calling. Let's run the race that's set before us. We hear it talked about at conferences and, and sermons and the race that's set before you is your race and your race is different than my race and my race is different than your race and you've got this calling over here. You're called to reach these people in this way and I'm over. That's not the race that he's talking about because what does he say the goal of this race is? He says, the race that is set before you looking to Jesus. Jesus is the finish line of the race we're all called to run. Because Paul is giving this example as like a sporting event. They're not all running different races. They're running the same race. We're all racing towards the face of Christ. We're all racing to the table. We're all racing with endurance to the presence of Jesus to get nourished in our soul. And Jesus is the goal, the end, and the finish line of that race. When we cross the finish line and we come into heaven and we see him face to face with no in between, with no, no distractions and nothing blinding us, nothing veiling our eyes, what an amazing trophy he is for, the, for finishing the race called life. And how amazing is it that he's, he's the trophy, but he's also the glass of water that you need in the middle of the race. And he's also the bread that nourishes you before your race. And he's there every single step of the way. And so we need to race to the table this morning. Just turn to the person next to you, tell him to race to the table. Don't wait any longer. Don't put it off till next week. Don't make it a New Year's resolution. Make it a now resolution. You need to race to the table. Run with endurance the race set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Jesus is the finish line of the race that is set before us. And the Psalms, you know, are a perfect example of what this is, it, what, what happens at the table, what happens in this refocusing. Because in the Psalms, you see David is crying out to God about these terrible, terrible things that have happened to him. And there's, there's, in a lot of these Psalms, there's this turning point somewhere in the middle and then it changes. So he's complaining up here and he's, he's crying out to God, explaining what's going on, just letting out the torment that's inside, letting it out verbally to God, which is sometimes a lot of prayer. When you're struggling, don't be afraid to just tell God what he already knows because it's not really for him. He knows what you're going through. It's for you to talk to him. It's for you to draw near to him. It's for you to open your heart willingly to your husband, your maker at the table. And so David would start off, a lot of these psalmists would start off complaining and, and airing out what's going on in their life, these terrible situations, and yet something would happen in the middle and then it would just change. But God, I know you're faithful and you're faithful to a thousand generations. And then I came into the house of God and I saw the end of the wicked and I was no longer jealous. And, and there's these moments, these turning moments that happen at the table. Well, we come to the table and we just begin to converse with him, but as we begin to talk with him, as we begin to converse with him, as we begin to eat and sit at the uh, table of fellowship with Jesus, those things that we complain about, those things that are difficult in our life, as we air them out, Christ begins to refocus. Yes, I see that. I see all those ways, but look at me and you'll walk on them. Peter, I know you see that. I know you see the wind. I know you see the waves. It's really, really obvious. It's incredibly distracting. I know. Look at me and you'll walk on it. I know your marriage is in a rough patch right now, but look at Jesus and you'll walk on that problem. And he will provide you a strength for that journey and he will give you wisdom for that journey and he will strengthen your bond with your spouse. I know that parenting can be really difficult and some of you have kids that you're just stressing out about all the time because they just seem to be so far off from what God has for them. And yet we know that Jesus has called us not to always look at the ways, but to look at him. And he says, you'll walk on that situation. I have the power to draw all men unto myself. Don't look at the waves, don't praise the waves, don't give your attention over there, talk to me about it. Come to the table and have a conversation with me about it. He's an amazing refocuser. And so for the distracted heart this morning, come to the table. For the malnourished in heart this morning who has, has been a while, who needs some real food, come to the table. You need strength for your journey. Come to the table. Point number three, my last point, is he shelters us at the table. He shelters us at the table. You know, Hurricane Milton just tore through after, you know, Hurricane Helene just tore through and it's just been crazy. If you can put those pictures up there. It's actually a hurricane so powerful it destroyed the quality of my images as well. 
some crazy damages that were done. This is the baseball stadium down there. The roof is just completely torn off. We have houses that are flipped upside down, the roofs that are completely caved in, people that have died, you know, and it's just a terrible situation. You have these storms that have such power and such destructive, chaotic power, and yet we see videos like this. Go ahead and put that up. We're in the eye of Hurricane Milton right now. Again, this is a storm that has now made landfall, and look what's going on. Nothing. The trees are barely moving. There's a, basically just a light breeze, no rain. And actually, I'm hearing birds chirping. I'm going to stop talking so you can hear it. But this just speaks to uh, the remarkable thing that happens during a hurricane. He's in the eye of Hurricane Milton. And the damage that you saw in those pictures is the same storm that that man was standing in the center of. And yet we see destruction all around in the first pictures. And yet in the, in the eye of the storm, there's peace and there's calm and there's birds chirping. And, and I'm not telling you tonight, this morning, excuse me, I'm used to Elevates on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. Shameless plug. I'm not telling you this morning that Jesus is just going to take every storm away because he promises us storms in our life. But he does promise us that he's going to put us in the eye of it. That the storm might be going on all around you. Destruction might be happening all around you. But there's a possibility for you to come to the table and have peace in your heart, no matter what's going on around you. No matter how stressful the situation is, no matter how crazy and chaotic, the storm around you does not have to infect you with the poison of chaos in your soul. You can come to the table and get quiet before God, and he can do something amazing like what he did on the boat. What did Jesus do on the boat? He slept in the storm. The disciples are thinking they're going to die, and Jesus is sitting there sleeping. Why? Because there was no storm on the inside of Jesus, even though there's a storm outside of him. And Jesus wants to make your heart clear again. He wants to clear the skies in your heart, clear the skies in your mind, clear the skies in your soul, so that we can actually be a witness that God is with us in the fire. We see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown into the furnace seven times hotter. The, the guards that threw them in burst into flames, disintegrated because of the heat and the pain. And yet we see a fourth man in the fire that they didn't throw in. Jesus put himself in the fire with them. Even though there's a fire all around them, what are they doing in it? They're dancing. They're dancing around in the flames. It was his presence that keeps us from burning. It's his presence that keeps our heart in the eye of the storm while the rest of the storm is destroying stuff around us. And it happens. It happens to everybody. Life is difficult. But he says, I can put the eye of the storm in your heart. I can make it actually peaceful here. I can shelter you. You just got to come to the table and look at me. You just got to come to the table and look at me. His eyes have this like gravitational pull to them. When you begin to look at him and you begin to just fellowship with him and you read his word, it's like this gravitational pull that he just pulls all the broken, scattered pieces of your life, broken, scattered pieces of your heart, and he pulls them all together, makes you one, gives you peace, makes you whole, heals you, delivers you, sets you free, puts, not just sets you free from the negatives, but he actually gives you the fruit of the spirit. He fills you with love and with peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control and all the beautiful things that come with his presence. He can fill you with joy in the midst of a place where everybody else is experiencing chaos only jesus can do that and the only place he can do it is at the table you've got to come to the table quiet yourself come to the table get nourished get refocused get sheltered i'd like to illustrate this i've got this table here and we've got some random items from my home including some homemade pickles that my wife made think about it some beautiful bread and some berries i just need a couple of volunteers i need like three volunteers to come up. We're not going to eat anything, so don't get too excited. All right, George. We need two more. Dad and Mike. All right. I was going to use my wife, but these guys are going to be my enemies, so I thought that might be a conflict of interest. <laughs> and so, you know, Psalm 23 says this thing where he says, you've prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You Can you put that picture of Jesus on the screen for me? He says, I will prepare a table for you in the presence of your enemies. And, and you know what's interesting? I used to kind of think that this verse just really meant that he's going to make your enemies watch and it's really just this tormenting thing. What I really found out is that you have to come to the table to get peace from all that. That the enemies actually can't sit at the table with God. And so we have enemy number one here. We've got difficulties in, in our life and this enemy is sickness and this enemy is going to try to attack me. Don't really, don't really, please. I just kick you in the knee. I know your weakness. I'm just kidding. I would never do that. I would never do that. 
back to being enemies. No, but we've got this enemy called sickness that's trying to attack my body and, and I could focus on that enemy and I could try to fight that enemy all day long. But guess what, guys? All three of these guys could probably take me, okay? So I can't just sit here and fight my enemies all day, which is oftentimes what Christians do is we just sit around fighting our enemy all day long. And guess what? The Bible actually says that it's not with weapons of our flesh that we fight the devil. It's weapons of warfare that are powerful, that are not carnal. But he says they are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Not mighty in you. Not mighty in your voice. Not mighty in your declaration. It's in God. And if you just want to sit around here and fight your enemies all day, the enemy's going to knock you around eventually because you're going to get tired. And we've got enemies over here and this guy's called betrayal and we've got this friend. I'm sorry, you guys will all be my friends after this, but not right now. This guy's called betrayal and we've got this, this person that we love that, that has either, you know, has betrayed us in the deepest way. They cheated on us in a relationship. They, they, they betrayed us. They talked about us behind our back. They, they pulled something so difficult, something like a Jesus Judas situation, like, like a David and Jonathan situation. And he's ruining our, my relationships. This, this demon called chaos is ruining my relationships. And I could sit here and try to fix my relationships all day long and fight that enemy. Or what I could do is I could go over here and I could fight this sickness. Or I could fight this guy here. Who, who what enemy are you? Uh, I don't know. What enemy am I? Raspy throat enemy. Yeah. <laughs> We could fight wayward children all day long. We could try and try and try and try and try. Fill in the blanks. These are your enemies too, okay? These guys will fight you too, trust me. Uh, so anxiety. I could see anxiety. We got anxiety. We've got mental issues. We've got, we've got depression here and he's trying to fight me and I could fight him all day long. I could fight sickness. I could try and fight anxiety and depression. I could fight this guy over here, this chaos in my relationships. Or what I could do is I could actually just stop fighting and sit down at the table and just look at Jesus and those enemies can't even sit with me at my table. I don't know if you've ever done it before, but it really works, actually. I don't know if you've done it before, but it really works. When you actually sit down in the middle of your enemies trying to fight you and you just don't look at them, as hard as it might be to turn your head, and as soon as you turn your head back to the enemies, you start sinking again, you're back from the table and you're trying in your own strength, turn your focus back to Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of your faith. And he has prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. The enemies cannot take my bread. They can't take my strawberries. They can't take my pickles, dad. They can't take my oranges. They can't take the centerpiece. They can't take the presence of God away from me. They can't take my intimacy with Jesus away from me. They can't take my prayer away from me. They can't take my worship away from me. They can't take my praise away from me. They can't take my faith away from me. I'm going to stand strong. And instead of looking around me at the waves, I'm going to look at Jesus and I'm going to walk on them. And Jesus will actually defeat my enemies anyways. Go sit down, enemies. I'm not scared of you anymore. Jesus will actually wipe out your enemies without you even trying. Because your weapons are not carnal. Your weapon is intimacy with Jesus. Sit down at the table and the enemies will scatter. I want to tell you one more story. I want to tell you one more story contrasting what Jesus did in temptation to what Eve did in temptation. Eve got into a conversation with the snake. And the snake slithered up to Eve. Well, he didn't slither. He probably had feet at that time because God cursed him to crawl on his belly. So he walked up to Eve. And it was, that sounds weird. He walks right up to Eve. And Eve is standing there by the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And she knows she's not supposed to eat it. She even thinks she's not supposed to touch it, which wasn't true. But the devil, the serpent, comes into her ear. And she begins to talk to the serpent. And what eventually happens is in her conversation with the, ser- the serpent, she's not talking to God. She's not verifying with her husband who heard it firsthand. She's not going back to the truth. She's sitting there and conversing with the devil, which we do every day of our life. We just converse with the enemy all day long, not realizing that there's actually a voice over here that's so powerful. There's entire Psalms that talk about the voice of the Lord, how it breaks cedars. It just, it breaks the rocks apart. It's just this powerful voice over here that can actually blast away your enemies. But Eve is in this conversation with the devil And because she's just in the conversation with the devil, the devil's really good at convincing. The Bible says he was the most cunning of all all creation. And so the devil convinces her to eat the fruit. And she sins, and, and there's shame, and there's sin, and sickness, and disease that enters the world, and all that death enters the world because of that conversation. And yet we see Jesus come face to face with the same serpent in the in the wilderness after his baptism. And he walks into the wilderness led by the Holy Spirit. If we could get Joseph, that would be great. 
He walks into the wilderness led by the Holy Spirit in communion with the Holy Spirit. Talks to the same serpent that deceived Eve in the garden. And instead of getting into a conversation with the devil, Jesus goes back to the bread. He goes back to the word. He goes back to the table. I know you say this devil, but I'm at the table right now and this is my bread. My bread says that I don't have to listen to you anymore. This is what the word of God, it is written. It is written, it is written. And what happened eventually is the devil couldn't talk to him anymore because Jesus isn't even having a conversation with him. He's just at the table with his father, eating of the bread, drinking of the wine, experiencing the joy and the fellowship of intimacy with his father. And the devil's trying to talk to his ear. He's like it's written he's not getting into conversation there's a reason that Jesus got better results with the devil than Eve did because Jesus went back to the table to get some bread when these snacks are over here trying to talk to him in his ear Jesus was smart enough and wise enough and close enough to God that he knew if I get up from the table and I try to do this I just need to sit down here at the table and eat this bread and all this stuff that's over here trying to tempt me is not going to win. The Bible says in Hebrews, he was tempted at all points and yet without sin. That is crazy. He's tempted and yet just as we are. So in the middle of, the, of your strongest temptation, whatever it might be, Christ knows how difficult it is to face temptation from the tempter. And yet he showed us firsthand what to do when the devil's trying to throw snacks in your face, trying to get you to cave, trying to get you to do this or do that, walk away from the plans of God. Jesus sat down at the table and he never got up. What did Jesus do early in the morning? All the time, the Bible says. He got up early in the morning before the sun, before everybody else is awake and he went and he climbed a mountain to be with his father. Other times he was ministering to people all day long, pouring out from his flesh. He has flesh and he was tired and exhausted and instead of going into his house to sleep on a comfortable bed he went up a mountain again while everybody was sleeping to commune with his father because he knew he needed to sit at the table constantly he knew his flesh needed the bread from heaven and I just want to tell you this morning no matter what is going on around the table it doesn't matter nearly as much as what's happening at the table because what's happening around the table can't touch what's on the table and Jesus is sitting at the table with you. And just like Pastor Jordan said, again, I got to reference this because this is exactly what I wanted to, to, to come across, is that we don't have to sit at the table and wait for Jesus to come and meet with us. Jesus is sitting at the table waiting for us to come and meet with him. It's actually a really beautifully tormenting thing to know that I can communicate with God whenever I want because every time I think about it and I'm not doing it, I think like, why am I not doing it? Why am I not praying right now? Why am I scrolling on my phone? Why am I doing this? Why am I doing that? I've got Jesus is sitting at the table right now. I literally have to just close my eyes. I just literally have to give him my attention. I just literally have to sit down at the table and I just can start eating bread right now. Whenever I'm tempted, whenever I'm craving the wrong things, I can just close my eyes and sit down at the table and just begin to be nourished and get refocused and get sheltered. I wanna read this last verse. It was, wasn't in my notes, but I really felt it in my heart to read it this morning. If we could just all stand to our feet. This is in Psalm 57, verses one and just one. <laughs> Psalm 57, verse one, he says this, be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge until the storms of destruction pass by. What a beautiful verse. He says, in the shadow of your wings, I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. Is Jesus your hiding place this morning? Is he your refuge? Is he the one that you run to? Is the table the place that you're constantly coming back to for nourishment, for refocusing, for shelter? Is he the one that you're, you're going to for life? Is he the one that's filling your soul? Or are you just busy eating some other junk? outside of this table that he set for you? Are you sleeping at the table, ignoring this beautiful meal that he's prepared for us in himself? If we could just all close our eyes and bow our heads, I just wanna invite you this morning to the table. And every single one of us this morning can sit down at the table right now, even in this building, even with people all around us, you can sit at the table right now. If you'll just give him your attention, just close your eyes right now. Give him your attention. 
just shift your attention to him. Say, Jesus, I don't really know what I'm doing. I don't know how to sit down. I don't know how to focus. I'm so busy. I'm so anxious. I've got this going on. But Lord, focus my heart. I turn my heart towards you. I just want to tell you I love you. I just want to be nourished by your, by your presence, the bread of your holy presence. If you're here today and it's been a long time since you sat down at the table and you need nourishment, I want to invite you back to the table this morning. I want to invite you to the altar. If that's you, I just want you to come forward into this, in this room. If you, if you are lacking nourishment, if it's been a long time since you've come to the table, since you've had intimate time with Jesus, if you've got so much focus on your enemies right now in this season, come to the table this morning. Come to the altar this morning. Kneel down at the altar and come to his face. Come to the table and look at him. He wants to restore you. He wants to fix what's broken. He wants to refocus you and nourish you. I just want to open this altar up at any point during the next couple of minutes. If you feel in your heart that you're distant from God, you need to sit down at the table. You need to refocus your life. You need to rededicate your life. You need to re re refire that intimacy flame with Him. Come to the altar at any point. But what I want to do now is I want to direct my attention to those of us in this room that have never sat down at that table. Those of us in this room that have never fully given their life over to Jesus Christ as their Lord. There is such a beautiful meal that He's prepared for you. All the things that you've tasted pale in comparison. Come taste and see that the Lord is good this morning. Give your heart to Jesus. Give your heart to Jesus this morning. Come to the table and experience the power of his beautiful presence that never leaves you and never forsakes you. If that's you in this place, you've never given your life to Jesus. You want to do that right now. You want to dedicate your life to the shepherd who's going to be with you from day one until day eternity. I want you to raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. If that's you and you just want to give your life to Jesus, I see your hand. You want to give your life to Jesus. You want to sit down at that table. You want to experience the power of God. You want to experience the love of God. I want to tell you this morning, God has a meal of love prepared for you. God loves you so much and he's got such a beautiful plan for your life. You've just got to stay focused on him. This is not difficult. So what we're going to do is we're going to come to him in faith. And we're going to say a prayer, but it's not the power of the prayer. It's the power of the person we're talking to. So everybody with one voice, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I come to you humbly, admitting that I need you to forgive my sin and to heal my broken heart. I cannot save myself. It's only in the cross and your blood poured out and your body that was broken that can heal me from the sickness of sin and can give me hope forever in heaven. So this morning, I dedicate my life to you. This is my line in the sand. Change me, make me a new creation in Christ. I believe that you died for me. I believe you rose from the dead and you're alive forevermore. I invite you to make me alive with you from the inside out. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. Everybody give those people a round of applause. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. We're gonna hand it over to Dr. Paul. We're gonna have some more altar ministry, so don't leave just yet.